Hello, welcome back to this lecture on digital communication using GNU radio. My name is Kumar Appaya. I belong to the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Bombay. So in this lecture, we are going to look closely at signal space again, something we have seen earlier, but with the demodulation perspective in mind and we will see how the use of signal space to convert your waveforms into statistics or numbers makes the demodulation process much easier. So now if you look at what we will see in this lecture, we are going to determine optimal receivers for MRE signaling in additive white Gaussian noise channels. In particular, rather than just sending one bit, if we send sim one of M symbols, which symbol was sent, the decision to make which symbol was sent at the receiver, how to do that optimally is something we will see in this lecture under additive white Gaussian noise. We will use the concepts of hypothesis testing, <coughs> signal space and the concept of irrelevance of some parts of the statistic that we do not need. In particular, we will show that only that part of noise which is along the components of the signal matter when you want to decide which symbol was sent. We will see this closely in this lecture. We will also look at the performance of various detectors and we will also find out how we can compute symbol error probabilities. So these concepts will take a bit of time, so we will see this over a few upcoming lectures. <clears throat> so the signal space approach is something we have already seen. Recall that whenever we want to send messages, one of let's say M messages, these M messages are sent as signals. That is for message 1, there is a potential waveform that is sent. For message 2, there is a different waveform. And at the receiver, your task is to determine which message was sent by looking at the received waveform. Now, this is the process of demodulation as we have seen, but the problem is that the received waveform is never an exact replication because the signal invariably undergoes some or the other transformation because it goes through a medium and there is always noise addition at the end. So that means that the receiver has only a distorted copy of the waveform. So the question is signals are complicated because if you start looking at modifications of the signal, there is an infinite set of modifications. For example, I can modify the signal at this location, this location, this location and there is a massive number of modifications that one can make. So the question is what is the best guess for what was sent given this received signal. Of course, the assumption we are going to make is we have additive Gaussian noise that to white meaning with time there is no correlation. So if we look at these HIs, okay, that is the question we are asking is you are observing y of t which is si of t plus n of t, i is one number, i is you know 0, 1, 2 up to n, m minus 1, one of those. The question is given y of t which si was sent. That's the same as saying which, mes which message was sent. N of t is white Gaussian noise which is added and its power spectral density as we discussed is defined as n naught by 2 because it's always n naught by 2 across one real dimension. So in the signal space approach, we have seen the signal space approach with regard to signal design and you know waveform design but now at the receiver we have to now appeal to the same tools to find out what signal was actually sent. So linear processing of a Gaussian of Gaussian noise actually yields a Gaussian random variable. Why does this happen? So let's say that you receive y of t and you perform some you know integration or filtering with y of t. The n of t component undergoes that filtering because of its fact because of the fact that it is being added when you uh, when you construct y of t and that results in a number that if you integrate n of t with respect to you know vt and there should be dt here of course then that results in a number and we of course define this as inner product nv okay so this is now a number so let's say that you know you want to essentially find out which waveform was sent by integrating y of t with some waveform and finding a number and that metric is what you want to use Unfortunately, the noise also undergoes the same transformation and then gives you a number. Now, you know that n of t has uh, mean 0, so expectation of z can be shown to 0, 
But what about the variance? Because essentially the noise variance is what affects your ability to determine what was sent. If the noise variance is very high, there's a chance that you'll jump all over the place. If the noise variance is low, maybe you'll just get the correct message all the time. So let's say that you have two waveforms V1 and V2 which are finite energy signals. Finite energy just is another proxy for saying that they are integrable. If n of t is a zero mean white Gaussian noise signal whose power spectral density is sigma square is n0 by 2, the power spectral density is sigma square for all frequencies n0 by 2, then n v1 that is integral n of t v1 of t dt and integral n of t v2 of t dt are jointly Gaussian with covariance n v1 of n, you know, n co the covariance of these two random variables is sigma square times v1 v2. This is a very powerful result because n of t is actually a complicated uh, signal because it is white. So, its statistics are very difficult to quantify in the sense that n of t1 and n of t2 are essentially uncorrelated, they are independent if t1 is not equal to t2. So, if you filter them or if you perform any multiplication and integration with waveforms, what can you say about the resulting random variables? It turns out that there is a very nice characterization. The covariance is just sigma square times the inner product v1, v2, which is a quantity that is finite and you know you can always just determine it because v1, v2 are integrable signals. For the specific case of you know in inner product nv with nv, in the sense uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the inner product, sorry, if you find the covariance of nv with itself, that turns out to be the variance of nv and that can be shown to be sigma square times norm v square. Of course, remember norm v is integral v square t dt. How do you prove this? So, this is not very difficult to prove. If you look at the expectation of n v 1 and n v 2, then you write the expectation in terms of integrals, but just be careful in writing the second integral using a different integrant, you know, a different letter actually. So, we write n t v 1 dt and n s v 2 ds. This is a double integral and we will just write it as double integral v1, v2. Remember v1, v2 are known finite energy signals. Expectation n of t, n of s, dt, ds. Now, expectation n of t, n of s, dt, ds. So, expectation n of t into n of s, remember we have n of t and n of s are independent if t is not equal to s and only if t equal to s, then it is not. So, this means and you know that the power spectral density of n of t is essentially sigma square. So, the autocorrelation function is going to be sigma square delta of t minus tau. So, that is what we are going to use. So, you can write expectation of n of t n of s as sigma square delta of t minus s. So, that is exactly what is being used over here. This also is uh, uh, because it is white sense stationary, you can you know that the autocorrelation depends only on the lag or the difference between the two times. Now, if we integrate with respect to ds, integrates integral sigma integral delta of t minus s dt ds. Yeah, so integral delta of t minus s dt ds. Now, I made another small uh, change. So, because I wrote delta of t minus s here, this is non-zero only when t equal to s. So, I silently just swap this t to s over here because this particular quantity is non-zero only when t is equal to s. Now, if you now perform the integration delta of t minus s ds, that results in this particular quantity going away and you have just sigma square times integral v1, v2 because the integral of the delta is essentially 1. <coughs> so, you have integral v1 of t, v2 of t dt which is sigma square inner product v1, v2. Now, there is one important point. If v1 and v2 are orthogonal signals that is inner product v1, v2 is 0, that leads to something interesting. That leads to the conclusion that this expectation n v1, n v2 is 0, which means that the resulting random variables are uncorrelated. Since they are jointly Gaussian and uncorrelated, they are independent. So, the fact that we have jointly Gaussian random variables all over the place is very important because these neat results essentially come together only because of the fact that they are jointly Gaussian. <coughs> so, what do we have in the signal space approach? If we look at a geometric interpretation of the projection of the white Gaussian noise, then the signal space spanned by the m signals is finite dimensional with dimension less than or equal to m. What does this mean? 
if you have the signals S0, S1, S2 up to Sm, the maximum dimension they can occupy is M potentially lesser because let's say that you're going to signal using just let's say some uh, S1 of t and uh, S2 of t is minus S1 of t. Let's say that you're doing something like a binary uh, signaling, you send either S1 or minus S1 or you send S1 or 0. In this case, M is 2 but the dimension is only 1 because it's the same signal flipped and the signals are essentially linear, linearly dependent. This, you know, the second signal is a linear combination of the first signal, for example. Or if you're going to send, let's say, the three potential signals, let's say S1 or S2 or S1 plus S2, let's say. So in this case, let's say S1 and S2 are orthogonal, but definitely S3 is not orthogonal to S1 and S2. And in fact, it's a linear combination. So again, there's M is 3 and your uh, dimension is 2. So the signal space is always finite dimensional, its dimension is less than or equal to m. The components of the white Gaussian noise orthogonal to the signal space are independent of the component in the signal space and thus irrelevant. Now this is a very powerful statement and this is a statement we will spend a little bit of time understanding. The thing is whenever you take the projection of the noise onto a particular signal, that is if you perform integral n of t, v of t dt, you get a number. You, if you perform integral n of t, v2 of t dt, you get a number. Let's say v1, v2, v3 are all orthogonal signals, you get multiple numbers. Now, what about that component of n of t, which is not along these signals, that also has some information. But what is important is that these parts, which have with these components of n of t that are not along the signal space in which the modulating signals are present, are orthogonal and therefore they are irrelevant. That is, they do not make any difference to your detection problem in finding out the best, uh, you, know, uh, so, you know, your best guess of which symbol was sent. The, uh, the other way to put this is the component of this noise along the signal space, that is, the component of N of t along your V1, V2, V3, which are potentially along the signal space are sufficient statistics. They are enough to make an optimal decision to determine which S was sent. And this can be reduced to a set of Gaussian random variables. So the key insight we are saying is this complicated N of t that affects your signal can be reduced to a set of numbers and these numbers are going to give you the answer of how to decide which M was sent. So rather than look at the complicated waveform question, we have reduced it to a number question. This makes things a lot simpler and you know you can now uh, be very happy that we are able to make optimal decisions by looking at a set of numbers by reducing the waveforms to just these numbers. To get an idea of the signal space picture, we will say let the signal space spanned by S0, S1 uh, up to Sm minus 1 of S, Sm minus 1 of T, let us say, be script S. Now, the orthonormal basis for this signal space can be uh, represented as psi 1, psi 2 up to psi n. Now notice that over here I have said psi n, so we have n is less than or equal to m because of the fact that the dimension is always less than or equal to the number of signals. You will have equality only when you do orthogonal signaling, okay, like fsk, otherwise in general it is n is less than or equal to m. The other thing is because these psi's are orthonormal, you have these two properties, psi 1 comma psi 2 is 0 and inner product psi 1 comma psi 1 is 1. This is true for all the signals, uh, not necessarily just for psi 1 and psi 2, but pairwise they are orthogonal and their energy is 0. Okay. Now, all of these SIs can be expressed as linear combinations of these psi's, that is Si of t is Ai1 psi1 of t plus Ai2 psi2 of t plus dot 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 Ain psi n of t. Okay? So essentially what we are saying is that the psi's are, we, uh, you can represent them as just um, linear combinations of the basis signals, the orthonormal basis signals. And these psi's are directly obtained by just projecting the S onto the sorry, these, uh, these AIKs are obtained by projecting the SIs onto the respective size. Now, this is something which we have mentioned before, but we want to do properly. 
The question is how do we find psi k from si of t? The answer if you want a systematic procedure is to perform Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. So the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization involves finding phi k plus 1 of t which is sk plus 1 of t minus inner product sk plus 1 times psi i times psi i. Okay, so fine, what, what, on earth, and where, and what on earth does this mean? What we are doing is, we are essentially initializing phi 1 of t as s0 of t by norm s0 of t. This gives us a phi 1. In the next step, actually this is, a, let us say this is psi 1 rather, let us say this is psi 1, okay. This is initialization step and the next step to find the to find you are basically now you have a signal which is orthogonal meaning ortho which, which let us not say orthogonal for a single signal it has unit energy and it is essentially s0 of t scaled to make it unit energy fine now the next question is if we take s1 of t how do we now get that part of s1 of t that is not related to s0 or not related to psi1 so how do we do that so we will we will now define a phi 2 of t as its s2 of t minus remove the component of psi 1 in s2 so inner product s2 comma psi 1 times psi 1 of t okay so now i am going to claim that this phi 2 is orthogonal to psi 1. How? It is very simple. If you take inner product of psi 1 and phi 2, you will get inner product psi 1 s 2 minus inner product psi 1 s 2 times psi 1, inner product psi, sorry, inner product psi 1 psi 1, inner product psi 1 psi 1 is 0. So, these two are essentially going to be cancelled out. So, this psi phi 2 is a signal that is orthogonal to psi 1 and if I now call psi 2, as phi 2 of t divided by norm phi 2, I get my second basis element. Okay? And this process can be iteratively performed to obtain a reasonable orthonormal basis from any S0 to Sm minus 1 you give. So, if you give me any m waveforms, I can use the Gram-Schmidt method to find out an orthonormal basis for the, this signal space. This is an important process because when you design your SS, you know you have to be cognizant of what the receiver design is going to be and to make sure that you are going to properly be able to, you have to make sure that you properly be able to find out the size so that you can project the noise, get these numbers is an important process. So, we will actually spend some time to do a reasonably big example to find out how this process works and then I will also tell you some methods by which you can actually directly see the signal and also write down your psi 1, psi 2 without any effort. So, this is something that we are going to look at in the coming lecture.